Good morning, good afternoon, maybe good evening if people in Asia are also uh, joining. So thanks very much to, to give us the chance here to discuss and to present what we're doing with VSIM in the plasma accelerator field. So I hope you all do well uh, and cope with the new uh, situation. Certainly we are extremely happy that we in our research group have a strong stronghold in uh, simulations, not, not even since, uh, you know, the, the new normal, but even before that. Uh, so our group is developing plasma wakefield accelerators aiming at beams with highest brightness uh, for applications in particularly also in particular also in the photon science sector. So we're located here in, uh, in Glasgow. Uh, but really we're spread out, we're spread out bunch because we are doing experiments, for example, also in the US. Uh, these are our main funders here in the US. Uh, we use clusters in the US. Uh, we do experiments in the UK and use computational resources and in the European Union. And well, teaching is nowadays delivered online and in digestible bits. And we are taking the same approach here today for this, uh, for this presentation. I'm starting to give an overview uh, and the physics background of uh, what we are doing. Uh, and then Fahim, uh, uh, Paul and Thomas, these are PIs in my group um, who concentrate on certain aspects of our simulations will take over. So I'm leaving the physics background and the overview that I'll pass on to Fahim who will talk about the plasma photocathode concept, which is a key concept for us because it's really the key to what's highest brightness from plasma accelerators. Uh, and then a little later, Paul will take over and talk about diagnostics, particular diagnostics of such ultra high brightness beams, uh, because these do not exist currently. And we are also developing them based on stimulations with VSIM, um, the ma major pillar. Uh, and then finally, last not last, Thomas will take over to talk about details on how we uh, not only guide, but also replicate and analyze experiments uh, and also how to bring, to scale down the size of these accelerators um, to, to the level where you can do it in, hopefully in the future in uni-scale labs and not only in big research centers. So the, generally as an introduction, the need for high energy and high brightness beams, high luminosity beams, well, you know, has led to the largest machines in the world, both for particles, high energy physics, for example, such as at SLAC, the LINAC or the LHC, but also for photons based on uh, electrons, such as the first X-ray free electron laser uh, at SLAC or upcoming or now in operation um, uh, X-ray free electron lasers around the world. So this is something which uh, early has been recognized as being unsustainable. So um, the reason for that is that in order to get to higher energies in particular, uh, you have to build larger accelerators. The reason for that is that uh, in conventional radio frequency driven accelerators, the accelerating fields are limited to the say, 50 megawatt, uh, megavolts per meter level because of breakdown of these nice and shiny accelerator cavity walls. This, this is gen, gen, basically you have microplasmas here. You can also model, for example, with VSIM, uh, which uh, lead to a field breakdown. So you can't really um, increase this uh, fundamentally. So what you can do in order to increase the energy gain here is to increase the distance here, the length of the accelerator section. And that leads to these kilometer long and therefore costly in construction and maintenance uh, accelerators. So plasma in contrast in that the chief attraction of plasma accelerators is already ionized. It is, you can't destroy it. Uh, it can sustain electric fields of the order of uh, well, terabolts per meter. So three or four orders of magnitude larger electric fields than in conventional accelerators. And in turn, um, this uh, allows you to decrease the accelerator length from the kilometer to the centimeter scale with associated cost benefits. So instead of having such a, a, a metallic cavity here, you have um, a transient plasma um, cavity which accelerates electrons here if you do it if you do it right and you can realize this uh, in the experiment. 
So that's, that's a big difference between these conventional types of large accelerators here. Again, you see the tunnels here uh, at the big, uh, big X-ray free electron lasers. And what happens, that's another difference, is the electron beams or particle beams in general are accelerated rather, rather slowly. You have these slow, uh, comparably modest gradients. And this is connected also to the size here of these cavities. The big, uh, big step here for the whole of the plasma wake field accelerator community is to go to plasma waves, which are excited by a suitable driver beam, uh, generate these tiny cavities, which also, which also that's another uh, important uh, difference, co-propagate yeah, with the drive beam. You see it here. Hopefully, it comes across smooth enough. Um, it is one cavity, basically, you only need one cavity which co-propagates instead of being static in the, in the laboratory frame. This is uh, a plot which is often used, so-called Livingston plot, something like the Moore's law of accelerators, which is used to visualize that um, the energy gain here, which increased over the decades, yeah, uh, somehow is no longer sustainable with commercial uh, technology, you see here the this box scale, that's the energy gain, the, uh, the gradient here, the, the slope of the energy gain over the years um, is decreasing. You also have not many machines that you can afford. Um, so this is something which has been recognized as unsustainable uh, on the longer run for these high energies. And if you take a step back, then really what happens in these all these machines which are used for research, for high energy physics and for imaging is you have a constant um, energy management, um, constant transformation of photons to electrons into brighter photons, more coherent photons into higher energy electrons. And this is visualized here. So uh, think, well, let's just start with our main energy source. Yeah, the sun emits incoherent broadband black body photons, which, of which then a certain fraction is uh, converted into uh, electrons really in uh, solar panels, uh, electrons which are then going into the grid. Those electrons are of course quite, uh, quite cold, um, have low kinetic energies. And these are then used, uh, for example, in semiconductor lasers in order to pump, pump lasers, which then can pump high intensity uh, high power laser pulses via population inversion. And these laser pulses here can be used in order to drive a plasma wave to kick out electrons um, and generate this transient plasma oscillation, this collective strong oscillation and uh, connected field in order to accelerate electrons now to uh, GeV uh, scale energies. And the goal is to use such electrons or electrons, of course, from radio frequency based uh, linear accelerators uh, in order to convert in the end into, um, into for example, X-ray flashes, coherent X-ray flashes in an FEL. And this plasma wake field acceleration, this laser driven plasma wake field acceleration, for example, was pioneered by, um, by the TechX, Precodes, uh, Vorpal, Visim uh, today. Um, and shown here is on this cover is this um, plasma wake, which described these experiments, which for the first time have shown that something like this is possible with reasonable electron beam quality. So if you go from left to right here, the electron energy and brightness increases via these consecutive conversion and refinement steps, and also the photon output, if you start from sunlight. Uh, and compare it to coherent ultra short X ray and uh, gamma ray flashes um, is con uh, increasingly improved. So that's the basic, this whole, this whole field. And this is, uh, yeah, many, many groups participate here. Um, uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main prospect here over many, many years has been uh, to generate compact versions of accelerators. But recently, and that's where we used VSIM to pioneer that, we also see that the quality and the brightness uh, of such, of the electron beams generated by such systems uh, can exceed um, 
hopefully conventional accelerators by orders of magnitude. And that's, of course, uh, another extremely important um, feature. So not only do we want to shrink accelerators from kilometer to centimeter or meter scale, but also we want to produce much, much brighter beams and connected photon beams based on plasma. So that's, that's our facility, uh, philosophy. In the end, we want to uh, do as much as we can plasma-based and compact. Now you can add the progress of plasma accelerators to the Livingston plot that's often done in order to show that you have a steep, uh, a steep learning and success uh, slope here in plasma accelerators here in red. This, of course, sort of an unfair comparison because this is only regarding the energy gain um, and not the beam quality. But I think in the future, if we include beam quality in such such a plot, that would be a worthwhile thing to do um, if we can continue on this path. Uh, that would be then a fairer comparison and one where plasma accelerators uh, may look really, really nice. So motivation is start of the art accelerators are kilometer long, costly in construction and maintenance, uh, 1 billion, uh, whatever currency, uh, that's the price tag of such large hard X-ray FELs. Plasma-based accelerators have thousand times stronger accelerating fields, hence can be meter long and potentially uh, you can think to translate that into uh, a corresponding cost um, uh, difference. And there's two major ways in order to generate plasma waves, uh, laser driven ones and electron or particle beam driven ones, which are similar, but also have significant differences. So. What's shown here is a laser pulse, an oscillating field which kicks out plasma electrons. Ions remain static. The laser pulse propagates to the right well, with its speed of light in plasma. Um, it generates this oscillation. The ions re-attract electrons and that constitutes this longitudinal wake field where you have here in the latter part of this so-called bubble here in case of laser wake field acceleration. Uh, these huge accelerating edge focusing fields, which can be used beautifully to accelerate. And similarly, um, you can use tight electron beams to drive such a system. And we shall see on the next slides that this has uh, some fundamental advantages and that really these two methods of uh, plasma wake field acceleration are, um, are um, highly complementary and um, uh, uh, can be exploited in, in such a manner. You see here also that the plasma wake scale length uh, is uh, small, 100 micron or so. Uh, and it co-propagates, as I said before, uh, with the drive beam. So everything happens in this, uh, in this uh, volume here. So that gives you an idea of what you have to do to simulate that. You need a moving window which co-propagates and the approximate simulation box size is then in 3D really, uh, approximately 200 uh, microns and in each uh, dimension. So let's talk for a minute uh, to give you the physics background about um, the similarities between electron driven so-called PWFA uh, where you generate such a blowout structure here compared to LWFA where you generate yeah, a similarly looking structure which uh, is typically called bubble to differentiate between these two major kinds of plasma wake field acceleration. Uh, so both have been modeled with reason to show that although the driver is different, here the electron beam driver propagating to the right, but it's an electron beam. Um, it is important to uh, have a certain size of this. So in order to resonantly uh, excite the plasma wave. Um, uh, and uh, here in this case, in LWFA, you have a, an intense laser pulse that drives the plasma wave. So this ratio here, uh, wave number times bunch length, defines the plasma density at which you uh, operate, something like 10 to the 17 or so per cubic centimeters, something you can generate in, in gas jets, for example, or uh, uh, sub-atmospheric um, gas reservoirs. Uh, the corresponding plasma wavelength here, that this length basically of the plasma wave is approximately 100 microns. 
And then you have also, of course, an associated plasma skin depth. And you see, it looks similar for an electron beam driver and for a laser pulse driver. And you can also uh, discriminate between different regimes here of interaction, whether you have a linear, so relatively weak plasma wave, or a strong nonlinear uh, plasma wave, which is called a blowout regime. The parameter which governs this is the so-called Q tilde parameter, which puts in, into relation the uh, densities of plasma and electron beam, because if the electron beam is stronger, the denser than the plasma, basically, then it generates such a strong perturbation of the plasma um, and the strong plasma wave. And similarly, this is probably more well known, the dimensionless light amplitude in case of LWFA here defines the strength of this A0 parameter, defines whether you are in the linear uh, regime, the weak plasma wave regime, or the strong nonlinear bubble regime here. So these two things also have been developed more or less in parallel, um, and because they are similar, but and you can also look into theory here um, and describe this not only with particle and cell codes, but this basically replicates the underlying physics. You have here the electron beam driver setting up the longitudinal wake field, uh, and it has this associated electrostatic potential, this parabola shaped. Uh, and similar uh, in LWFA, you have the driver propagating to the right, setting up the electric accelerating field and focusing field and having this electrostatic potential and the formalism is therefore also uh, also similar so these are similarities but they are profound and important differences and one immediately visible one is that an electron beam here that's the, the green guy here um, is a unipolar it's of course negatively charged and hence also the electric field uh, Lorentz contracted if it propagates through vacuum or through matter uh, points in one direction away from the electron beam, obviously. Um, while in LWFA, a focused laser pulse, well, it's an electromagnetic wave. It oscillates, and that's visualized here. Uh, basically, what, what happens if such an LWFA uh, laser pulse uh, hits an electron in vacuum? Um, let's see, uh, Lawson Woodward theorem. Uh, it does not transfer energy because the electron oscillates up and down. And uh, this is something which, of course, does not generate a plasma wave. It only does if you have the intensities so high that you get the significant ponderomotive force you see here. Um, it's a second order effect. And hence, you need extremely high oscillating fields in order to, via the ponderomotive force, generate a plasma wave. while um, if you if all you want to generate is uh, to expel electrons off axis transversely obviously intuitively clear um, a unidirectional field such as produced by an electron beam is better suited uh, to kick out electrons and to drive the plasma wave and highlighted therefore here is that the peak fields associated with an electron beam driver or pwfa is orders of magnitude here three orders of magnitude smaller than the peak electric field of a laser pulse uh, you require in order to generate a plasma wave. Because here, in, in case of the PWFA, you use uh, you exploit the Coulomb force just uh, in order to kick out electrons. So intuitively, uh, or yeah, intuitively, PWFA is more straightforward, you could also say more efficient to excite plasma wave. Uh, and without the need for super high peak electric fields. And that's very, very important because that allows us to play around with different ionization thresholds in order to generate controllable high brightness, highest brightness beams. But on the other hand, yeah, I, I mentioned the complementarity. Lasers are much better to generate plasma, to ionize stuff via tunneling ionization or barrier suppression ionization because of the super high fields Basically, they mean that you rip out electrons from the, um, from the atom uh, already at comparably low intensities. And that's another thing which we exploit. I'll come to that in a couple of, couple of slides. Another thing is also, although the electric fields which you use for acceleration are high, 50 gigavolts per meter, 
in order to sustain the density of the drive beam over a significant long enough uh, distance, say a centimeter or a couple of centimeters, uh, then um, you have to deal with the fact that a laser pulse here dictated by Gaussian optics um, diffracts. So if you want to focus it to high intensities, you focus it strong, which means at the same time, the Rayleigh length here is low, uh, which also means that the laser intensity is quickly lost because of diffraction. Um, and that's an issue. You have certain effects which help you in LWFA, such as relativistic self-focusing, but this is not, uh, not easy and it is not, uh, not too stable. Um, while on the other hand, if you have a relativistic electron beam as a driver, that stays tight over uh, long distances, uh, just like that, without any uh, assistance or, or tricks. So you see again, the formalism here for the transverse beam size, independent or independence of the longitudinal coordinate here is formally similar to the size of a laser pulse during diffraction that are, here's the Rayleigh length, the corresponding um, parameter here, the beta function length at the waist here. And if you look at that, uh, you see that the initial or the focus size here squared plays a role, but also then the electron beam energy or the electron energy and its emittance. While uh, the Rayleigh length here is defined also, of course, by the spot size, the focus spot size, and the wavelength. Because for these laser pulses, uh, basically the, the, the typical, or basically the only candidate here, uh, practically currently is a titanium sapphire laser with a wavelength of 0.8 micron. This defines that the Rayleigh length if you focus to a suitable spot size of 10 microns, is of the order of a couple of hundreds of microns, um, which limits your acceleration distance. While if you look at comparable parameters, 10 micron spot size, uh, gamma Lorentz factor of 2000, so one GeV of electron beam energy, and the typical emittance here, uh, then your length over which the electron beam stays constant is 20 centimeters, um, uh, just like that, without, without any tricks. So this is another great important feature which uh, helps you to accelerate not only at high gradient, but also su to sustain that gradient over tens of centimeters. So because of this extra parameter here, emittance, which you can sort of tune, yeah, um, the laser policy is fixed to 0.8 micrometer wavelength and hence Beta function of electron beam drivers is uh, very long, orders of magnitude longer than the Rayleigh length, the limiting factor here with regard to diffraction for LWFA. And then we have another, basically the third important point here, dephasing. That's an issue. Um, let me just see uh, chat window, I'm not sure whether there's questions. Well, you guys will, will interrupt me uh, if there are urgent ones or if I cannot be heard or anything. Uh, dephasing, yeah, that's a big problem for laser-driven wakefield acceleration because in vacuum, well, a laser pulse propagates with the speed of light. However, um, in plasma, it doesn't because it has to interact, the laser pulse, the photons have to interact with matter. Uh, they're slower than the speed of light in vacuum and soon also slower than the electron beams which you accelerate uh, in the plasma. So the group velocity here uh, is dependent on the, uh, on the plasma frequency here uh, of the laser pulse. It's smaller than the speed of light. Um, and if you plot this here, then you see, it's the electron beam energy in blue uh, that at some energies of 10 or 100 MeV, um, the electron beams are, um, uh, have a higher velocity than uh, the laser pulse here plotted in red at suitable plasma uh, electron densities. And that means, indicated here with the dashed line, that electrons move forward in this uh, plasma wave. And because the accelerating phase and the strongest accelerating phase is here in the back, uh, and from the middle of the blowout, basically, you have a decelerating field, no longer an accelerating field. That means that uh, you have a so-called dephasing limit, a dephasing distance uh, dependent on the electron beam density 
um, which limits the energy gain uh, in addition to diffraction. Again, if you look at an electron beam driver um, of high enough energy, say uh, 1 GeV, this is propagating basically with the speed of light. The associated uh, gamma factor here is, say, 10 to the 4 for a 10 GeV drive beam. And that means that you have a practically phase constant, beautiful system because an injected um, witness beam electron, which uh, is accelerated in this plasma wave by the drive beam, uh, will stay at this position and will phase constantly be accelerated at high gradients. But it also makes a number of other uh, things much easier if you have such a more or less static relation. So the electron beam here transfers energy into the plasma and the plasma transfers energy into the witness beam, which is accelerated. Uh, so this is another great advantage from the viewpoint of using plasmas as an accelerator. Um, but again, there is a two sides uh, here of the, of the coin. Uh, LWFA, on the other hand, because um, of, of these features, is better can easily achieve self-injection. Self-injection is a process if this plasma wave here captures plasma electrons from the background plasma, injects them, and then generates a more or less well-defined beam. And that's another thing which, which we exploit here. OK, so these are the, the differences, again, here summarized. I don't go through all these details again, but this is a summary. Electron beams here are excellent in order to set up a phase constant um, uh, plasma wave over extended distances, while laser pulses here are uh, great to ionize matter and also to inject uh, electrons. So if you want to summarize the top level uh, message here is electron bunches are great plasma drivers, laser pulses are great for ionization and injection. Um, and the, the issue is uh, that because of these, uh, say, shortcomings, really, yeah, of uh, LWFA, um, the beam quality, which so far can be generated and also theoretically can be generated by LWFA, uh, is limited. And that's an issue for applications because you want a compact plasma accelerator, but you also want the highest possible uh, quality out of this uh, plasma accelerator, and for certain important implications, such as free electron lasers, yeah, the engines of discovery, uh, there are thresholds. It's not something which uh, goes more or less well, but it has a threshold uh, or certain thresholds which so far um, are obstacles which um, are very difficult for LWFA to reach, and certainly there's not a game changer inside based on LWFA that could exceed these thresholds, uh, uh, which are, for example, for, um, for an FPL, so-called Pellegrini or emittance criterion, the normalized emittance or the tightness and transverse phase space, if you want, of an electron beam has to be lower than, um, uh, than, than this side of the, uh, of the equation, the radiation wavelengths which you aim at uh, times the electron beam energy Lorentz factor. And because this emittance, even in conventional accelerators, is uh, limited, yeah, micrometer radian typically, um, in order to reach hard X ray wavelengths, which you want for imaging of atomic structures, for example, you need high electron beam energies. And that's what you see here in the size of the tunnel systems for the LCLS, the LCLS 2. Uh, it is of kilometer scale and is the energy spread um, of the electron beam. In order to allow proper micro-bunching, you need uh, a low energy spread, low relative energy spreads uh, at a certain energy, uh, smaller than the PS parameter here in order to achieve lasing. Um, and if you want so a key performance parameter of electron beams for this very, very important application, but also for other applications, is the brightness. The composite parameter here, 60 brightness, um, which includes the current, so the duration and charge of the electron beam, the emittance of the electron beam in both transverse planes, and the energy spread. So that's 
really combines basically these important parameters and the duration and, and current, so the density in real and phase space of the electron beam. Um, and this is also defining then the, the gain and gain length of an FEL. Um, it scales with the brightness, so you want as high brightness as you can, and the current brightness levels obtainable in conventional Linux um, are such that you need hundreds uh, meters of, of length annulators to drive the photon field uh, saturation to generate the X-ray flashes, and that's a cost driver, the dominated cost of these uh, FELs. So again, if you can improve the brightness, uh, that would be fantastic. But LWFA, there's no concept inside where LWFA could achieve uh, a hard X-ray FEL or even be better than conventional Linux. But I think from combination of laser-driven plasma wake fields and electron-driven plasma wake fields, um, we can not only have compact high gradient accelerators, but also extremely high brightness gradient, uh, sorry, high brightness output from such plasma accelerators. And that's sketched here. Um, so we take really the best of both worlds. I've shown these complementary um, advantages of these two approaches to realize what we call hybrid plasma-based accelerators, um, where we exploit the advantages of electron-driven accelerators or plasma waves. Um, the electron beam drives the plasma wave beautifully with this unipolar field uh, over long distance, stable fashion, generates the accelerating field, and then what we add here is um, a laser pulse, a focused laser pulse uh, of comparably modest intensity to ionize one of the involved plasma species here to localize, uh, to localize these, uh, these green guys here, electrons via tunneling ionization. And you need only low intensities and correspondingly low powers, comparably low powers gigawatt uh, um, when compared to hundreds of terawatt in LWFA systems. So what we do here is by introduce or combining these systems is to, um, to realize something which we call a plasma-based photocathode. So the laser pulse releases electrons, cold electrons from plasma. Um, so the injection process here is uh, decoupled from the drive beam and the plasma wave. Um, and that allows to um, produce in a controlled fashion Ultra cold uh, and ultra bright, therefore, soon ultra bright witness electron beams in this plasma wave. Uh, so, this is something which we explored based on an idea, and uh, well, back then we used, um, we used uh, uh, Warple, so the predecessor of, uh, of VSIM, uh, basically in order to explore and confirm this idea in simulations. You see, Similarly, the drive beam here propagates through the plasma. This is the, uh, the laser pulse, which is focused. And this snapshot here has already released electrons uh, from uh, a background helium gas, so that you have helium electrons here produced that are captured uh, and then accelerated quickly in this plasma wave, moving with the speed of light through the plasma. So the ingredients here are an electron beam, a dense electron beam, which you can take from RF Linux or from laser plasma accelerators. Uh, the synchronized laser pulse here, uh, focused to the ionization threshold of helium. Now that's not a big threshold for high power gases. Basically, you can get, uh, get away with fiber lasers, in principle, focused fiber lasers in order to do this. Uh, so potentially at high rep rate. Released electrons are then trapped, accelerated, and are focused and produce a bunch with ultra low emittance as the key ingredient or the key reason of why the brightness is so, uh, so high. What you also need is two plasma components, one with low and one with high ionization threshold. Um, in this case here, in that paper, we used lithium here to uh, model it uh, with, uh, with VSIM and in addition, uh, neutral gas helium in order to release this. But in principle, that also works with other types of gases only they need to have different ionization potentials, such as helium and, and hydrogen. And in this cartoon now, uh, 
uh, I, I show you what, what happens. Maybe that makes things a little clearer. So this laser pulse here is being focused. It co-propagates. Now reaches the ionization threshold of helium, releases electrons. They are uh, uh, left behind by the, uh, not left behind by the uh, forward propagating plasma uh, blowout, but they are rapidly accelerated. So that this is now a quasi-static system propagating, um, propagating in, in this direction here to the right. And the, yeah, you see already here that this is a tight bunch which is not expelled by the laser pulse to the outside because the laser pulse intensity and hence the ponderomotive force is uh, negligible. And that's exactly what you want for an injector, not to drive the plasma wave, but for an injector, you want exactly that. You want transversely um, uh, cold electrons. And so this system acts not only as an energy transformer from drive beam to witness beam, but also as a brightness transformer. Uh, the potential here is gigantic. Yeah? The, the, you can increase the factor of brightness here because of the low emissions and the quadratic scaling by a factor of one, 100,000 compared to the state of the art today. The other thing which is also really beautiful is these bunches here are automatically uh, short. So you don't only have a photogun here and an accelerator, but also a compressor um, in one system. And if you know how much of an issue uh, CSR and such things are in conventional accelerators to get those high quality beams, but also short beams in, in compressors, this is something which is uh, beautifully elegant. So a little bit more detail. Why is the witness sponge ultra cold? Well, because the laser pulse intensity and therefore the peak uh, electric fields here are comparably low, much lower than in LWFA. So four orders of magnitude lower than in LWFA or in terms of A0. Uh, this is the, uh, the difference here. And that means that the residual momentum which electrons obtain here in this passing and ionizing laser pulse will be very, very low. And because the transverse momentum here of electron beams is one, one part of the, uh, the emittance uh, um, calculation, um, and because the, the released electron beam here is very compact in real space, you have with recipes for an electron beam of very, very low um, emittance. So also important is that the initial phase space volume is low, that phase mixing is sort of, uh, can be minimized. And also very important, the electrons are so rapidly accelerated uh, that the space charge, which can, which can blow up the, um, the emittance due to repulsion of electrons in, inside the electron bunch, decreases as gamma to the minus, to the power of minus two. Uh, so because of the rapid acceleration, you don't, uh, spoil your emittance and you get another beautiful effect. Many of those, uh, you get also ions which are produced that's shown here in this piece of simulation output helium ions here, which in the initial phase, or well, they stay behind yeah, because they're quasi static, but they do their uh, contribution to shield the electron beam uh, emittance here. So if we uh, look at this in a, in a simulation, yet again, an ancient simulation, which we did back then, that's a drive beam, that's a laser pulse. It releases helium electrons, which are then captured here, stay tight and have these very, very low emittances down to the nanometer radian, uh, radian level. So this is the reason why these electron beam, beams are ultra cold, have ultra low emittance and in turn ultra high brightness. And well, if you think of uh, what, what the invention of conventional electron photoguns um, uh, achieved, yeah, basically uh, that was the, on the accelerator side of things, the key to realize free electron lasers, hard X-ray free electron lasers at slack. The photogun, they're also a laser pulse releases electrons from the cathode, stuff which can also be beautifully modeled by, by reason, by the way, but we don't do this in our Group, but the principle is similar. You release electrons here, although no via tunneling ionization, but via the photoelectric effect, um, which are then extracted by an as high as possible um, uh, static or uh, radio frequency field or hybrid versions in order to get them to speed quickly so that they don't blow up in their emittance. So the principle is again, uh, you could say similar. However, the fields 
uh, in plasmas are orders of magnitude higher. And these high extraction fields here and the controlled release of electrons by the plasma photocathode are the key, um, uh, yeah, the key uh, for achieving ultra high brightness. So it all makes sense. And if you look now at, at values and put them in perspective to uh, of brightness of what plasma accelerators, state of the art plasma accelerators can do today, and also what these huge Linux, these uh, 1 billion price tag uh, XFELs can do. Um, then you see that the, the prospect of this plasma photocathode combined with plasma wake field acceleration is huge. So this is the projected 60 brightness here, taking into account the current of the produced small electron beams, the emittance in both transverse planes and the energy spread. Well, and these bunches produced by the plasma photocathode have automatically multi kiloamp current, nanometer radian emittance, um, and via something which uh, Fahim in particular talk about, um, uh, basically exploiting beam loading, loading in phase constant accelerators, the energy spread can also be low. And if you plot this here, note the log scale here, you see that plasma photocathodes have prospect of producing um, four or five orders of magnitude higher brightness compared to state of the art, not only of plasma accelerators, but also of uh, these giant machines at reasonable electron beam energy, which is also important. So the brightness reach of plasma photocathodes is huge. And if you put in uh, these numbers, which are in the, uh, in the range of, or in the reach of plasma photocathodes for emittance, for energy spread, for current, then you see that these uh, Trojan halls or plasma photocathode generated ultra high brightness beams uh, with ease um, can fulfill the emittance criterion, for example, even for an XFEL, so it means if you have beams of tens of nanometer radian emittance instead of micrometer radians, you can well either push towards harder X-ray wavelength here, or you can operate at low electron energies or both. You certainly don't have a, an issue to fulfill this criterion. And also uh, because of this additional technology we developed, the energy spread criterion can be um, uh, exceeded. Oh, sorry, no, fulfilled. And the gain here, because it scales with the brightness, uh, is then also something which in an undulator gives you enormous gain. Uh, and also it produces, because of the high gain, then very short uh, photon pulses. And this is something which we don't talk about much, but this is certainly one of our drivers. You have the electron beam driver realized and the plasma photocathode to generate beams of ultra high brightness. And then you can transport them, uh, you put them into an undulator uh, where you can obtain uh, just yeah, breathtaking results. Uh, and this is something which we do in a side project where rhythm simulations play a central role. So, so that's, that's theory, but of course we have a mix Yes, yeah, sorry guys. I think there was an issue with my, my Wi Fi. Um, can you hear me again? Hello, hello. We can hear you. Hello, yeah, we can hear uh, you now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I hope I was not gone for too long. <laughs> no, just a moment. Very good, very good. Okay, so I'm using my smartphone now. So this is the experiment at Facet, which 
uh, which we use to demonstrate the feasibility of this plasma photocathode technique. And don't worry, um, we'll guide you through individual steps here and how we simulated uh, individual steps with VSIM. Just as, a, as an overview, we had the facet electron beam, a high energy electron beam as the driver of our plasma wave. We needed a pre-ionized plasma with a laser pulse here. And then we realized the plasma photocathode, because you can do it in various geometries, in 90 degrees here for various reasons. But you see the, the pre-ionized plasma channel here, that's the red blob here, that's, that's an important, um, uh, say, bottleneck here. And the synchronization between beams also plays, um, plays a role. So um, let me just show you the pre-ionization of the plasma, of course, needs to come first. So this laser pulse has to arrive first, but then you need also synchronization of the plasma photocathode laser pulse with the plasma wave driven by the electron beam. Um, and these are challenges here, but just as a, as a comment here, don't confuse uh, the apparent complexity here with doability because these are individual blocks which uh, can be realized. And that's what we did as a teaser here. I show you uh, VSIM 3D output of that scenario here. That's the electron beam driving the plasma wave. That's the ionizing laser beam causing this plasma wave. And you see that fraction of helium electrons which are released inside this plasma wave are captured. That's the plasma photocathode mechanism. And this is uh, what we realized here at FACET when it still occupied the first two thirds of the, of the slag linac. Um, and this is, this is uh, uh, a beautiful uh, well, concept, but also a beautiful visualization based on these. Um, uh, we published these results in Nature Physics. Did not quite make it the front page with the cover, but instead, uh, we made the cover here of, uh, well, the oldest uh, scientific journal of the world, yeah, um, in order to demonstrate that this is uh, a viable process and demonstrates uh, exactly what we uh, assumed based on these simulations. Uh, and because we know what's, what's going on, we want, of course, to drive this process further, much cleaner. So certain restrictions have made things hard at FACET here. Uh, the size of the plasma wave, 100 microns, the 90 degree geometry is not ideal. So what we want to do here, for example, the next proof of concept uh, at FACET 2 is the E310 Trojan Horse 2 experiment at FACET 2 use larger plasma waves, matched drive beams, collinear geometry uh, in order to really uh, get a controlled uh, well-defined process. I hope you can see this. The laser pulse here ionizes the helium electrons and then really produces this well-defined ultra-bright injected beam. So that's the <laughs> next experimental big milestone which we which we aim at. So if we go back to this overview slide here where I try to I use this, um, this concept of continuous refination of uh, uh, laser beam and photon and electron beam quality. It does not stop here. Yeah, that's the key message here. It does not stop with laser wave acceleration, which is great to produce electron beams. You, that's what we think. You need an additional step. We convert this electron beam here, accelerated by LWFA or from a radio frequency LINAC, um, in a PWFA plasma photocathode uh, step into something even brighter. Because then you can really uh, release um, and exploit applications. So the electron beam energy and brightness is boosted by uh, 10,000, 100,000. And then um, the impact for photon beam generation and other things in high energy physics are, are huge. Yeah, here again, another type of overview, the electron beam drive input. Yeah, you send an electron beam in the plasma, which drives the plasma. But then in a decoupled fashion, you produce an electron beam output, which is much, much brighter and then is used for applications. For example, the XFEL, but also beta tron radiation, inverse Compton scattering for gammas, for example, but also for high energy physics. So that's the underlying uh, physics here. Um, and as I, as I said here, this is our central uh, 
uh, argument, the plasma photocathodes in an advanced fashion, which you call next source. Uh, and this plasma wave can be driven either by RF uh, generated electron beams or from plasma, laser plasma accelerators, such as we produce here at, at SCARPA in, in Glasgow, um, in order then to transform applications. So this is my, my overview. Um, I now pass on to Fahim, um, who will talk about uh, details on how to model uh, the plasma photocathode courses in view of optimizing for an XFEL. So I'm stopping the screen share so uh, that Fahim, you can grab the screen. Uh, all right, thanks Bernard. Um, can you guys see my uh, screen with the slides? Yep. Excellent. Uh, all right, Bernard, thank you very much for the very nice introduction. So uh, it leaves me then uh, to focus more uh, on the uh, key matter. Um, so as Bernard already mentioned, so we have essentially what we need for the uh, plasma photocathode uh, and plasma Wakefield accelerator, which uh, essentially composed of um, the plasma channel medium, or uh, if you want to call it the uh, accel actually accelerator uh, medium, so which can be a low ionization threshold material such as helium and lithium, which you can easily pre-ionize. And in a simulation, you would uh, uh, introduce such a uh, medium in BSIM, for example, uh, as a microparticles in the background with uh, either a certain temperature, but typically if you pre-ionize them with the laser, so you would rather assume them as a cold. And then of course you need the energy carrier, which would be in this case, uh, uh, ultra relativistic electron beam, uh, as Bernard already indicated before, uh, where the electron beam is the actual energy carrier. So it transforms the energy to the plasma electrons in the simulation box. And uh, uh, what is important here, so you wanna have uh, electron distribution, uh, which can be, uh, which can evolve in the simulation. So uh, you would, for example, use uh, the concept of macroparticles as well. So uh, to make sure that the electron beam is interacting on the plasma and the plasma and the ion, uh, immobile ion background acts back on the driver beam. And then, uh, but last not least is the actual photocathode, uh, the innovation Bernard talked uh, uh, about here. So um, you would need a second uh, gas component, which is in the background, uh, but neutral. And um, you would use a co-propagating uh, short laser pulse to, uh, with very low intensity to release those particles from the charge carrier. So just quickly to summarize, so the plasma accelerator, you, you need the plasma channel and the driver, which sets up the wake field and the uh, accelerating cavity. And on another side for the plasma photocathode, you would need a neutral background uh, gas, for example, hel helium, because helium is excellent compared to uh, hydrogen. So the helium uh, first and second level has a much higher ionization threshold. So you make sure that this helium is not ionized, for example, by your pre-ionization laser. And uh, you have this low intensity laser, uh, which uh, imprints or has a very little pondomative force on the electrons. So it means when those electrons are born are in rest. So because this fundamental force is so little, you can, for example, resolve the laser. But um, so some studies already, uh, which have been published a couple of years ago showed already that, for example, an envelope laser will do the job as well. Um, okay, let's discuss quickly I mean, what are the requirements actually on PIC codes? So um, maybe uh, from the perspective of our group. So we have uh, this one pillar developing concepts or uh, developing ideas in a proof of concept manner in PIC simulations. So we will need detailed simulation analysis and a simple modular structure. So where we can more or less assemble uh, the underlying uh, system. But at the same time, um, we need a simulation tool which can uh, take into account experimental boundary conditions. And some of the audience who have been in the experiment, they certainly know uh, that uh, they uh, can be very important. So they are more or less the initial conditions of your experiments and then incorporate measured data and uh, incorporate complex ge geometry. And uh, such experiment Bernard already mentioned was the E to 10 experiment. Um, so where you have realistic boundary conditions of an experiment. And um, so every experiment in a sense has its own challenges. And um, Wiesem, 
used to be indeed our simulation backbone and all those pillars. And um, so those many, many publications uh, and there are many others which I don't show here uh, because of slide limits here, but uh, Vizim was indeed supporting in both of those cases, but at the same time Vizim enabled as well designing experiment, new experiments uh, in a very phenomenological uh, way. So let me discuss quickly uh, about the so-called E to 10 experiment. And uh, so the key part is here, for example, this uh, plasma channel, which was really a bottleneck uh, in the experiment and limited uh, a lot of uh, achievable uh, measurements, which we didn't, uh, couldn't do it or uh, um, which we observed in experiment. So essentially this, this very tiny plasma channel because uh, where you would drive your uh, plasma wave was uh, determining essentially the blowout size, which is directly linked to the plasma wavelength. So it has to be small enough, uh, but not too strong to, for example, to ionize the second neutral gas helium in the background uh, and not to cause, for example, dark currents and hotspots. So doing this experiment and uh, uh, modeling it as accurate as possible, and that's essentially uh, uh, what we did, uh, together with the experimental campaign and it turned out to be very very successful uh, with reason together so let me quickly introduce uh, this experiment and uh, bernard already mentioned uh, it that it was uh, um, realized in 90 degree geometry as a, a proof of concept experiment uh, Keep in mind that the initial Trojan horse with the low emittance beams is rather in collinear geometry where the laser is co-propagates with, uh, with the wake. But here, the laser is coming from, uh, from the side in a 90 degree geometry. And now, uh, if you change the timing of the laser, uh, then you can achieve various of injection regime. And one of them is the so-called plasma torch. Paul will later on discuss more details on that, but let me focus on the Trojan horse one. So if you reduce the laser energy further and adjust the timing in such a way that you just hit the uh, uh, blood structure, uh, that's for example shown in, uh, in those uh, experimental results. So what you see here is the injection chart against the timing and negative timing is here when the laser is ahead of the uh, charged particle beam and positive timing is uh, when uh, the laser is um, coming after the charged particle beam. And this area uh, time of arrival around zero approximately, um, that's the area where, we, where you would hit the first bucket of the plasma accelerator. So if you reduce further the energy, then you will switch off this torch regime uh, further and uh, you will slowly end up with the um, 90 degree Trojan horse regime. And as you can see, those orange dots are uh, originating from um, the PIC simulations, and they represent quite well uh, the measured charts uh, in an experiment. And so let's discuss quickly uh, how, how this entire uh, simulation campaigns in the each 10 experiment uh, was built on. So the main building blocks have been indeed uh, modeling the hydrogen plasma channel with its funny uh, geometry, uh, including this background helium having a driver beam which evolved until this point because the injection point was, um, if we go quickly back here, is this red line. So is uh, at 0.2 and then the driver needs to propagate up to this point and uh, where the laser is coming from 90 degree ge uh, geometry to hit the blood structure. And uh, of course, additionally to that, advanced simulation analysis in conjunction with, uh, for example, reason trajectory capabilities revealed uh, some uh, very unique and actually quite neat uh, details uh, about the experiment. So uh, see, we had this experiment and then we modeled that and this modeling with reason actually enabled us to uh, deepen our understanding of the actual experiment. And uh, let me show you this um, small simulation. So you, this blue guy is the driver beam, which already propagated approximately for 20 centimeters through the plasma. Those uh, black dots are the plasma channel electrons and setting up this wake field. And you will see from the bottom now, the laser pulse releasing directly inside the blowout structure and those electrons are trapped and uh, those green lines indicating the trajectory of those electrons. So this was 
indeed a very successful uh, simulation campaign uh, uh, and uh, experimental campaign. Uh, however, because of the bottleneck of the plasma channel, uh, uh, Thomas will discuss later more about this and this 100 micron plasma wavelength. Uh, it limited us uh, quite uh, significantly in, for example, achievable energy and stability. And what we want to do at FACET2, and this is already a approved experiment there, is, for example, operate at much larger plasma wavelengths and, uh, and collinear geometry. So because that's where you uh, expect the highest brightness uh, uh, electron beams uh, from this uh, injection method. And additionally to that, uh, operating at larger plasma wavelengths, um, it's quite easy, easy to understand, uh, um, provides as well a much higher stability. Because simply, um, if you think about a smaller, um, smaller blowout structure or smaller blowout structure volume, uh, so the jitter typically from uh, a laser pulse uh, synchronized with the electron beam uh, is typically, so for example, in the state of the art machines of the order of 30 femtosecond to 10 femtosecond. So it means it might jitter around, so you will release your electrons at different uh, phases within the wake and they will trap uh, at different uh, accelerating gradients. However, now if you operate at much larger blowout structure, so for example at 250 or 300 micron or even larger, then even still this uh, um, 30 femtosecond jitter will result in a much, much smaller jitter in the acceleration phase, which means um, your energy will be uh, stabilized uh, uh, significantly. And that's something uh, we are aiming for facet. So we want to release those particles at the potential minimum where you have the highest injection efficiency. And uh, at the same time, uh, operate at large blowout structure to reduce uh, any source of beam parameter jitter and uh, to uh, obtain the highest brightness beams. So additionally to that, um, so this experimental campaign uh, was so successful. Um, we have been uh, working on concepts, for example, to uh, resolve some of the fundamental uh, problems in plasma accelerators. And that's again where uh, such a theory uh, in conjunction with uh, a powerful simulation tool can be uh, very helpful. So for example, here, uh, you have seen already this uh, sketch a few times. Uh, um, you have this very huge gradient, and this huge gradient comes actually at the price. So if you have a charged particle beam, for example, an electron sitting at this gradient, then the head of the particle will see a, a lower accelerating gradient than the tail of the particle. Um, and let me switch off this one than uh, uh, the tail of the particle. So this will ultimately result in the so-called positive energy spread. So, so you can see it here in this uh, cold fluid uh, uh, theoretical, uh, semi-theoretical uh, modeling. So you have this guy and then uh, in the longitudinal phase space where the head has lower energy than uh, uh, the tail. And this can be problematic uh, on a number of levels. So extracting beams with this kind of uh, linear energy correlation can cause um, energy degradation, uh, energy spread degradation, and uh, can cause, for example, uh, uh, additional issues downstream, for example, if you use a beam transport line. So this inherent problem to plasma wake field accelerators uh, needs an uh, urgent solution. And uh, so we resolved this uh, problem with producing beams with very small emittance and uh, very compact in time, resulting in very high so-called 5T brightness. But in order to obtain really the, 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 the 6T brightness, or maybe as Bernard referred, another refinement step, we need very high uh, 60 brightness beams. So this means that the beam is compact in all six dimensions, in three uh, um, spatial dimension and three momentum dimensions. So uh, phase compact beam. And um, so essentially when you realize once uh, a plasma photocathode in collinear geometry, so there's uh, no magic behind to add a second laser and to synchronize it into the wake. And that's essentially what, uh, with our so-called escort-based uh, method uh, take advantage of. So 
we inject first a very high brightness electron beam. So uh, as you can uh, see it here in this cartoon, with the first laser, we let the electron beam accelerate to relativistic energy to stabilize it uh, against any space charge issues. And uh, at the later stage of the acceleration, uh, we release a second charge population, which we call escort beam and uh, of very high charge. And this escort beam, when it overlaps at the trapping position of the witness beam, will ultimately overload the wake field. So, uh, so first you had this, uh, this slope of the wake field where the head of the beam, the witness beam sees uh, higher, uh, low, sorry, lower gradient than uh, the tail. Uh, while uh, in this situation, your witness beam head sees a uh, higher gradient than uh, uh, the tail. So what essentially happens here that uh, the witness beam phase space will start uh, counter rotate and uh, there will be a certain position as, as shown by this animation where uh, the phase space will be compensated and that would be the extraction position. And at the same time, the beam brightness uh, will be preserved uh, during this uh, process. So this is great. I mean, this is uh, uh, theoretical considerations, but uh, we have been able indeed to uh, model this in 3D with uh, WISM. And um, you can see here the slice through uh, the wake field. And uh, currently at this position, uh, our first laser pulse is releasing the high quality witness beam. Uh, and uh, on the Right hand side, top right, you see the longitudinal phase space and here you see track data uh, of uh, witness beam properties. So for example, the dashed blue line is the uh, energy spread and uh, the purple line is the beam brightness. And um, when I start the simulation, you will see witness beam is injected and it's at the later stage, uh, there will be now uh, uh, second population of charge, which is released and overloads the swake. And uh, you can ultimately, uh, let me play this again for you, uh, see that the witness beam first accumulates uh, energy chirp, but up to the point when we release the second charge population. And then you see how nicely it rotates back. And uh, here where the energy spread is, energy chirp is minimized, that would be, for example, the extraction position. So essentially, uh, in this simulation after 2.4 uh, uh, centimeters of propagation. But at the same time, you can see that the sex dimensional brightness is uh, uh, peaking at that position. So this is all great. And uh, um, so we essentially asked ourselves, um, so there's this uh, residual energy spread. So when you compensate the energy chirp, where it comes from, and then again, so the tracking tools, for example, in VISM helped us to uh, understand the uh, origin of the uh, residual energy spread of the witness beam. And we were able to derive from that uh, a very simple scaling law uh, to estimate the, the reach of the energy spread of, uh, for example, plasma photocathode electron beams. And what we found out, it's quite uh, astonishing. And uh, so we see that, for example, larger blowout sizes are not only uh, beneficial for beam stability and beam parameter stability, but at the same time, they uh, allow to uh, obtain very small relative energy spread at comparably low energy. And I mean, this is indeed, uh, some great results uh, in perspective to uh, key applications such as FEL. And uh, on the right hand side, you see, for example, this linear chirp is here before dechirping. And then uh, when you um, apply the escort beam based dechirping method, then uh, you can see that, for example, already at uh, 1.6 GeV electron beam energy, you can obtain and you spread uh, far below one percentage level, which is approximately of the order you would require for uh, FEL applications. So let's quickly dive a little bit more. And I mean, those beams are great, but uh, um, as Bernard already indicated, they're excellent candidates for uh, light source generation, not only light source, but as well others, but I will focus uh, solely on them. So for example, X-ray free electron laser, where you generate very short uh, X-ray flashes or 
uh, inverse Compton scattering for MEV scale uh, energies or even more advanced like ion channel laser. However, this kind of stop to end simulations, they are quite challenging because first of all, you have to accelerate your witness beam to uh, multi uh, uh, GV energies, which means a multi centimeter scale uh, simulation. So um, you need a very high efficiency code to um, increase the efficiency uh, with the number of CPUs. So that's first. And then additionally to that, you have to suppress numerical instabilities, uh, mitigate artificial emittance growth, uh, which can be a, a big issue. And um, you need a sufficient number of macro particles already at the plasma accelerator stage in order uh, not to run into numerical challenges uh, in those downstream uh, um, codes which you might use for particle beam tracking through a transport line or for uh, radiation generation in X-ray free electron laser. And coming back from uh, essentially from uh, this modeling campaign within the E to 10 experiment and this conceptual development of this escort beam method, we um, essentially uh, uh, had learned a number of lessons in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, how we can optimize our simulation and how can we, for example, uh, get rid of all those numerical issues. And uh, to mention a couple of them is, uh, for example, um, we analyze the perfect dispersion macro, which uh, uh, reduces numerical noise significantly. And then, for example, we implemented a proper beam initialization of the driver beam, which avoids artificial space charge uh, artifacts uh, in the simulation. And we implemented, for example, the background hit medium, essentially the plasma photocathode uh, charge carrier uh, as a background fluid gas, which enabled us to uh, inject beams with very high uh, number of macro particles. And additionally, this fluid trick uh, allowed us to uh, reduce significantly HPC computing time. And um, that's, uh, of course, uh, something uh, alongside on the one side, but then we adapted a very completely new approach, uh, which, for example, uh, extracts driver beam, witness beam, and plasma e EM fields independently and allows us uh, really to look into the details. And this is important uh, for experiment, but even more important when we, when we develop conceptual ideas for um, uh, certain applications. And uh, just to show you so, uh, the comparison between some old and new simulations, uh, that's for example, uh, on the right hand side. So you see this uh, numerical uh, Cherenkov peak. So the, the first uh, overload from the, way, from the escort beam is um, modeled rightly, but then um, you have this step, which is part of uh, the numerical Cherenkov. However, this is a very general problem of uh, e solver peak codes. So those of you who are familiar, but uh, indeed, this new set of simulations, uh, uh, together with, uh, as well with uh, help from TechX and Visum, so um, we managed to uh, get rid of that. And as you can see, uh, this uh, beam loading is very clean for this, from this electron beam, which is trapped in the wake. Uh, so this is excellent and uh, sounds very promising, but let me dive a little bit more into this um, split field simulation approach. And uh, essentially what we did, we um, in particular to, uh, to control the simulation more precisely, but uh, at the same time to analyze it uh, much more precisely, for example, the interaction between uh, the driver beam and the plasma field. So we separated the field of the plasma of the wake field and the uh, charge density and currents uh, within the peak cycle from uh, the actual driver beam. Uh, but they still both interact in both ways. However, we dump them very separately. And that's a very strong feature, uh, which is embedded actually in uh, VSIM. And uh, so we discovered along uh, uh, the lessons learned from, for example, E to 10 and the conceptual uh, um, analysis. So this is one simulation, as you can see, uh, 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 very exciting uh, um, in, in a sense that this is the plasma wake fields and on the right side is the driver beam and you can actually see uh, very precisely how they each, uh, how they uh, interact with each other. And at the same time, I mean, those simulations have been uh, run with uh, approximately um, 43 million uh, macro particles and uh, 
the witness beam counts approximately with 500k macroparticles. And they are very efficient uh, for this kind of uh, high resolution, large scale uh, modeling cases. So, um, I mean, Bernard discussed it uh, uh, already, but uh, so this is the main goal for this kind of, uh, one of the main goal for this kind of modeling to uh, tackle uh, first and start uh, to end simulations, the FEL challenges. So we resolved uh, by now the, uh, the physics challenges, which uh, includes the so-called Pellegrini criterion with the emittance, energy spread, and the gain length. We uh, attacked as well the beam transport line with proper electron beam with a significant num a sufficient number of macro particles. And there's as well um, FEL simulations more refined and uh, which showing the uh, very high FEL gain. So I'm not gonna dive into uh, this one, but uh, because this will require a whole new uh, talk for itself. However, those FEL simulation, FELs are um, quite picky in a sense. So uh, you need very high beam parameter stability. And that's a challenge for uh, plasma accelerators. And uh, with this new kind of, or new generation of these simulations, uh, we are able, because they are so efficient, uh, uh, in CPU time to run extensive uh, uh, parameter stabilities. And then here again, so we we are guided by the E to 10 experiment. And um, so we were able to understand the main jitter sources, uh, for example, the laser beam and the uh, ionization channel for itself. So then we jittered, for example, the, uh, the laser transversely uh, in timing jitter and as well the laser amplitude. and. Uh, we were wondering, uh, so what are the stabilities of those parameters? And at the same time, we, uh, we assumed a very wide plasma channel where we essentially uh, get rid of any plasma channel boundary effects. And as you can see, this is a, a very high density summary of uh, such a simulation. So this is the on axis accelerating gradient evolution along the propagation distance. And you see that because uh, what Bernard was talking about the phase constant acceleration, so the, the witness beam is seeing uh, more or less the same accelerating gradient. So the consequence of that, and at the same time, uh, the jitters we uh, implemented in this set of uh, modeling showed us that, uh, for example, the energy stability in uh, larger plasma wavelengths, so 250 microns, can be easily at sub-percentage level, which is excellent in the requirement for uh, FEL application. At the same time, for example, the charge stability is at the sub-picoset uh, uh, picoculum, sorry, uh, level. And this sounds very promising, but however, so the most important uh, beam parameter is for, uh, for FEL application is the composite parameters, 5D and 6D brightness. And indeed you see, even if you vary your uh, beam missile, uh, in, in the ecto laser misalignment, timing jitter and uh, laser amplitude, the stability of 5D and 6D brightness is uh, uh, comparable to uh, state-of-the-art uh, radio frequency based uh, FEL machines. Mm -hmm. And um, this is very promising results for, uh, for example, future accelerators. So in a sense, the plasma photocathode not only uh, produces very high brightness beam, but at the same time is, has very intrinsic stabilization properties in itself. And I guess here I would love to give over to Bernard. Yeah, that's great, Fahim. And guys, I'm conscious of uh, regard to the time. Um, so let me try to make a little bit uh, of time here. Um, I assume you can see the field. So I want to say that indeed this plasma wake field driven FEL or XFEL is a major thrust. Uh, and it comes very timely because the UK uh, seriously considers now also to build an XFEL. And I won't go into details, but this may look familiar to you. So that's part of the science case for the UK XFEL, which has recently been uh, published. And that's really a milestone because our uh, simulation results, the theory, which is all sound, uh, and also the first experimental confirmations of the technology have led uh, the, um, the the science case, uh, have led to the, the, the case that the science case already includes the prospect of such PWFA Trojan horse 
afterburner um, elements for the UK XFL. So that's really a milestone because before uh, XFLs were unthinkable to be driven by plasma brake field accelerators and now we have them implemented in the science case and hopefully if this project goes on in the CDR and TDR. I won't go into details here but shown is just that you can also uh, retrospectively think of adding plasma bake field accelerator afterburners uh, into existing uh, European XFEL or the uh, US XFELs. Uh, so this is all quite exciting but I want to move on to give this overview picture here. We really have now this ecosystem of plasma-based approaches both for acceleration, plasma accelerators and the huge gradients here, but also with regards to the brightness and the beam quality, 1,000, 10,000, uh, 10, 100,000 times brighter than state of the art for applications. And, but another very, very important component is here, how do you measure such high brightness beams at very low emittance? And the key here uh, is hopefully, potentially, uh, to use plasma also as an, um, for metrology, as a measurement uh, medium, because it is so sensitive. And with this, I want to move over to Powell, who talks about these pl so-called plasma afterglow uh, diagnostics. Yeah, right. Thanks, Bernard. Um, I will just quickly share my slides. All right. No. Okay, can you see, uh, see my slides? Yeah, just not now. Okay. Yeah, Excellent, are. thanks very much. Okay, so I will quickly talk about um, plasma-based diagnostics we have developed experimentally and studied uh, numerically um, afterwards. And then I will quickly lead over to um, uh, a, a related and a very, very interesting in, uh, plasma-based injector, which we call Plasma Torch, which we have also quantified and developed during experimental campaigns. So um, we, uh, I just start with a very quick review. So um, you may remember this um, this, break, uh, this plasma photocathode scheme where a synchronized laser pulse ionizes electrons directly within the brake field. But in order to do so, we must ensure that this laser pulse is synchronized and aligned with respect to, the, to this uh, accelerating structure with very high accuracy. So um, basically, um, um, if we look at an ex uh, experimental layout, we are now only uh, considering this interaction point here where the injector laser uh, creates uh, those electrons. And we now need to make sure that those electrons are released within this, um, this cavity. So um, this is uh, very challenging because uh, we need femtosecond and micrometer uh, level um, resolution. But we also have the problem that we can't place established diagnostics here because of the high intensity of the focus drive beam, but also because we have the plasma channel present here, which would immediately destroy or at least damage um, most diagnostics. So, but we have observed in the experiment an effect which is called uh, plasma afterglow. So when you have uh, this plasma filament uh, ignited by the laser pulse, you see a recombination light uh, in the region where the plasma has been created. But now if you um, send the electron beam through this uh, plasma region, it gets enhanced and strongly amplified. And this mechanism can be used now to, um, to check whether the electron beam or the laser pulse has arrived first or um, vice versa. Um, so in order to study this effect numerically, we need to reduce the problem. So uh, the the geometry we are now studying here uh, only contain the focused laser pulse and um, a gas region where the electron beam propagates through. And the plasma filament is basically a column, a plasma column um, of, the, um, of the size of the electron beam in one direction and then uh, of a certain width in the other one. And uh, well, the problem here is that the simulation boxes are quite large, so we need millimeter scale uh, boxes and at the same time high resolution and a lot of particles to study this um, this effect. But um, if we do it right, we can um, create a simulation like here. So the electron beam and its fields are shown on the left-hand side and there's the laser pulse which sets up um, the plasma column via uh, tunneling ionization. 
And now the electron beam crosses and you see there's a strong disturbance in the plasma center and a lot of electrons shown here, um, color coded by the energy, get um, expelled from the filament. And um, the, the remaining ions, which are much heavier, they don't move for a sufficient long time in order to form a strong attracting potential for the electrons to, to circulate around um, this filament and to form those um, funny trajectories here. I will repeat it just uh, another time. So electron beam crosses the filament, strong perturbations um, propagate along the plasma, electrons get expelled and form um, oscillation uh, patterns around the filament. And uh, those are other stationary results from VSIM. So this is the direct interaction where you see that uh, directly after the beam has passed, the plasma electrons get expelled rapidly. And down here, you can see the electric fields and those are of the order of the beam fields themselves. So it's gigavolts per meter waves that propagate along the filament and distribute the energy along this millimeter sized plasma column. And uh, a few picoseconds later, um, the potential, which you can see here, has formed the electrostatic put or like electrodynamic potential around the filament core. And uh, the electrons now propagate around this. And they can scatter, and they do scatter um, with ambient gas. And those gas atoms can be ionized and then create more plasma, which then forms the enhanced afterglow, which I've shown earlier. And uh, based on our simulations, we have, um, we have learned that this interaction basically is an overlap between the electron beam field distribution and the plasma filament distribution, which um, kind of gives us now um, a tool to, to exploit. Because um, if we have a fixed electron beam from a linear accelerator, we can now vary the, the plasma distribution in order to learn um, a lot about um, the beam beam plasma interaction, for example, in a plasma accelerator. So and down here, you can see um, three different uh, time of arrival settings where the laser pulse arrives before, on time, or later than the electron beam. And depending on this time of arrival, for example, the energy transfer from the plasma to, uh, from the beam to the plasma um, changes dramatically. And this can be seen here. So on the top, you see um, snapshots from those experimental filaments. And here, the, electron, uh, the laser pulse has formed the full plasma before the electron beam arrives, whereas here, the laser pulse arrives after the electron beam. And if we now do a smooth scan from this setting to this, you see this nice waterfall plot where the afterglow intensity drops dramatically in this region here. So the, the response becomes much weaker and smaller and uh, yields a very strong gradient. And the gradient is always a perfect tool for diagnostics. So on the, on the bottom figure here, you can see three lines. It's the same time of arrival scan. First, um, in red, there's the experimental curve. Then um, the, the particle and cell simulation, which is quite close. And then the model, which is um, this overlap model here. And you can see that the agreement is quite nice and um, can now be used for, for synchronization tool. Because on this trans transition region, we can measure the time of arrival based on the afterglow um, response very accurately. And the same can, of course, be done by varying the plasma uh, radially. So if we now um, move the focal position um, away from the electron beam axis, we also basically sample the beam volume, the beam fields in this region. And um, this also leads to a very distinct transition shape. But in this case, it's not um, an error function, but more like a Gaussian shape. And this is uh, due to the fact that the electron beam is almost a Gaussian radially. And again, we see a good agreement between the experiment in red and uh, particle and cell simulations and the model. So um, just wrapping this up quickly. Um, so we have this um, plasma being an ideal detector medium, which can sustain super high fields and also the presence of other plasma, of course. And uh, this plasma filament is so sensitive that it can transform the very fine femtosecond and micrometer scale interaction to a large microscopic observable, which can be uh, measured with a simple CCD camera, for example. And this then helps uh, to synchronize and to overlap the wake field in the plasma accelerator, for example, with the laser pulse, and this can facilitate injection. And uh, now, since both curves depend strongly on the electron beam shape, 
we can um, expand this method in order to learn a lot about the electron beam itself. So um, we can um, we can study very intense electron beams directly at a focal point just by using a simple plasma filament uh, in the beam line. So and uh, now we will show um, a very short excerpt. Uh, so what happens if you can control the alignment and the time of arrival for this laser pulse? So of course you can do the plasma photocathode, which releases electrons directly inside the wake, but you can also do a very related but still uh, distinctly distinctively different um, injection mechanism, which creates a plasma filament right in front of the wake field. So now here um, we have a baseline uh, plasma channel, for example, as um, as in the other accelerator schemes we found uh, we've shown earlier. But now this additional spike in front of the wake field um, expands the wake field for a very short time, and this gradient here uh, leads to um, leads to a formation, a change of the blowout shape, and um, can inject a very high quality electron beam. Um, the advantage here is that you don't need to synchronize this, uh, this laser pulse to a femtosecond scale, but rather on the picosecond scale, which is much easier, easier to achieve. And this is a simulation um, a colleague of my group has produced with Visum. So this is um, the co-moving cool frame. Here you see the wake and the drive beam, and this is the plasma torch, which is basically a column. And black lines are trajectories from electrons that are subsequent, uh, subsequently trapped and accelerated. And um, maybe again. So you really can see if you if you look at the projections on the sides that the, the additional uh, plasma density here really shapes and changes the, the wake field shape. And this change, this very local dis uh, perturbation is the reason why we can inject uh, electron beams uh, with very uh, well controlled manner. And this has been uh, measured experimentally. So for example, we can control the injection uh, by switching on and off the laser pulse. Uh, we get GEV beams with uh, millimeter milliradian um, emittance. And this um, has been done in the context of the plasma photocathode. And uh, without uh, repeating this, the, um, uh, we, we can distinguish between the two modes by simply tuning the laser energy and by tuning the timing, the time of arrival of the laser pulse. And uh, for high energies, we get the plasma torch at a mixed mode of the photocathode, whereas uh, by, re uh, by reducing the laser energy, we only get the, the photocathode mode. And this is a nice um, outcome because we now learn that we can uh, control the uh, injection. We can, can control um, the injected charge via laser timing, but we can also control it via laser energy. And laser energy basically um, changes the, the density gradient, the plasma shape here. This is 0.5, 1, and uh, 5 millijoules laser energy. And uh, those different filaments now have a very distinct effect on the on the wake field. So here you see the three cases. Wake field propagates to the right, and here you see the perturbation, and it's uh, too big for particles to get injected and trapped in the first case. But for, uh, for the second and the third, you see that uh, depending on the strength of this perturbation, more and more charge can be trapped. And again, which is quite astonishing, the mechanism or the scaling which uh, determines the trapped charge here is very similar to, this, um, to the scaling we have seen in the afterglow um, part. So it's basically the overlap between the wake field in this time, so the wake field distribution and um, the plasma filament. And again, we can now use um, a changed filament in order to control this injection quite nicely. Um, of course, we have a very high performance simulation set already, but uh, most importantly is now that uh, we can track and tag all particles within the simulation. And this enables us to, to identify and to distinguish between very um, interesting modes of operation. So for example, we uh, can distinguish between uh, narrow and wide plasma filaments. We start with the wide ones where the diameter is wider than the wake field, as uh, shown here. And now we can control um, the trap charge via um, controlling the ramp length, so kind of the, de the density gradient on the downstream side of the torch. And uh, this, um, this shape here, resembles um, conventional downrim physics, density downrim injection. And uh, here you can see two different cases, for example, um, short ramp and a very long ramp. The core is identical. And the, um, the, the colored 
areas are the volumes where trapped electrons origin from. So this is based on, uh, on, on tracking and tagging of particles. And you see a very nice uh, round shape, which is typical for downwind projection schemes. And here, uh, the, the core message is, so we can control the trap charge, but we can also uh, get very high quality and symmetric beams if we have a very symmetric interaction geometry. Um, a short video here quickly. So this is the original trapping volumes. And, and you can see that uh, the beam distributions in, in uh, Yx, Zx, and the transverse plane, they're very regular. They're very homogeneous and there's no difference uh, uh, whether the electrons originate from the top or the bottom side, which is the color coding here. So this is the symmetric mode of, of plasma torch injection and basically um, typical density down rim injection. Right. Okay, but this can now be changed. So if we, uh, since we use a laser, we can control the plasma filament size. And uh, if we go to a narrow plasma filament core and very steep gradients on the sides, we uh, find this new regime here. So um, a drop at a very short ramps where the plasma is simply too narrow um, to fully cover the wake field. And this has very interesting effects or, or consequences because it first reduces the trap charge, but it also um, introduces an asymmetry in the um, injection volume. So you, you clearly see that um, the top and the bottom parts are much more pronounced here than the sides, which is basically just cropping the injection volume. And from the side view, you, side view, you can see that this is now this now clearly uh, yields a top and a bottom species, um, which is uh, injected and later on forms the beam. And this can be um, further increased by using realistic asymmetric drive beams. So here those shapes are expanded much, much more strongly than here. And again, there's a, a video here. So there's a top and a bottom species in this case. And you can clearly see that there are, oh, so this is a side view, uh, there are two species which are counter oscillating in real space, which means that we have a, an inherently um, yeah, strong beta tron radiator. We have two beams which have almost identical parameters, but uh, they are strongly separated in space. So this is a very new and formerly unknown um, regime, which might be very um, interesting for probing or new kinds of X-ray generation. Right, so this is my last slide. So um, we have a very nice um, tool for uh, beam diagnostics via this afterglow method, where a filament um, interacts with a beam. And the same geometry basically um, yields a very nice um, plasma-based injector, which gives stable, high-quality um, particle beams. Okay, great. Uh, Bernard, thanks. That's great, Paul. Uh, thanks very much. So uh, let me quickly go on here to say that we have, by this iteration between simulations guiding, using simulations to guide experiments, have a range of these injector type experiments approved for FACET 2 and at other facilities, but also these um, diagnostic based um, experiments. So uh, it's, it's very fruitful and uh, we um, also have, because of the high confidence level, which by now we have in our simulations, uh, um, the ability to put these experiments and these prospects in a really forward-looking manner into, uh, into community roadmaps um, in order to also then pull uh, experiments um, in, in order to achieve these high brightness beams with associated diagnostics. Um, so that's that's general community roadmaps, but we also have our own group roadmap where we have basically four thrusts here, the injector type experiments, uh, the uh, simulation of light sources type thrust, the metrology thrust, and another one, uh, namely hybrid LWFA, PWFA, uh, which in the future can be used to, to boost capacities and make particularly compact um, accelerators. I don't go through the milestones here, just want to say that Thomas will now uh, talk about some experimental replication of experiments, but also about this hybrid approach where we use output from LWFA 
the electron beam output from LWFA because that's what they can do, very dense bunches to drive PWFA and the Trojan horse scheme. That also goes back like now a decade when, when we used UPIC, uh, but uh, that also picked up a lot of steam and um, uh, Thomas will talk about experimental uh, and uh, other the issues connected with this. Yeah, thanks, Bernard. Um, so I'll try to share my slides. Um, please let me know if something cannot be seen or if I can't be heard. Um, so I'm going to focus a bit um, into the data dealing with simulations to understand better what happened in the experiments. Um, but also it will be a bit more technical um, for, for resim specific things. So not so many physics as we heard uh, already today. Um, so, but the main idea is that um, as we heard, simulations are a great tool to discover new concepts and develop these concepts. But it's also very important to understand in a particular experiment, um, which contributions actually played a role there. And simulations can be very great there because usually not everything is empirically accessible in experiments. Um, typically you can measure a lot of things, but usually you don't measure everything at the same time always. Um, and particularly there are multiple past interactions uh, during these injection schemes, which you typically cannot uh, measure directly. So there's where simulations really can um, uh, provide another view, a duality, so to say, to your experimental measurements. Um, and this is enabled by simulations because, because you can basically really track the origins of your electrons. You can separate the fields and the particle species and really uh, identify where individual contrib contributions are coming from. And you can also, and that's important for the um, thing I'm going to talk about in the next five minutes, um, uh, evaluate how your electron beams evolve during the acceleration. And uh, as one example case, which we already heard about, um, is the ionization channel, which we used in the E210 experiments. So um, as Fahim already pointed out, uh, one of the experimental challenges was to create a long plasma column for um, long acceleration distance, but also it needs to be sufficiently wide to host the plasma wave, which is in the end limited by your experimental boundary conditions, for example, the laser energy. Um, and to really identify which contributions there really play a role for your entire accelerator, um, we use simulations to um, get to the ground of these things. So <clears throat> maybe just very quickly, how is this plasma channel generated? Um, so we used a laser to uh, build this pre-ionized plasma column. And for that, we use uh, an axial lens, which basically generates these sort of transverse vessel profiles. And it results in this sort of funny looking intensity distribution. And basically what we did is then take this intensity distribution and calculate um, what is the resulting plasma which we actually generated inside the experiment. Um, something which um, is almost a meter wide, so which you can't really diagnose for every single detail of this shape. But with these calculations, you can basically identify how the shape of this plasma column actually looked like. And it turns out that it actually has this kind of longitudinally oscillating structure. And just um, as we already heard, the, the um, transformation from intensity profile to such a plasma profile is basically just by applying some um, calculations for tunnel ionization, which is based on the so-called ADK model, which is the same as is built in VSIM for uh, in-simulation uh, ionization diagnostics. Um, so how do we actually put this funny looking plasma profile now into VSIM? And this is um, more like a, one of these technical questions. And uh, potentially, this is also of interest for other um, users of VSIM, which are not directly in the plasma acceleration business. Um, but it is entirely possible to put very complex structures into VSIM um, just by, by defining macroparticle distributions. So the typically way you would start to think about it is to use this as T-Funk uh, capabilities. Um, this works very well if you can explain or describe your plasma distribution with um, polynomials, for example. But this is not always the case, in particular, and not so easy um, in this plasma channel we had. Uh, so 
another option we thought about is um, just define a macro particle distribution and load it um, directly onto the grid, which is also very possible in vSIM. But it's not always practical to do this beforehand, especially not if you want to change your resolution at some point. You could also use um, external functions um, like uh, from a Python interface, which is also very doable. But uh, in the end, we came actually up with um, building our own data interpolation function within vSIM. And <clears throat> just showing that this is possible, um, I think is quite interesting for, for other users as well. So basically, what we did is use this user func interface um, together with a definition of macros, uh, terms, functions, and uh, using some list utilities. And this actually works very great um, because it's directly built in, in the pre-file. Um, we were able to um, set up a system which is completely reliable, which is convenient to use because it, you don't need to change anything if you change your resolution because everything happens on the fly. And basically uh, this function interpolates the, um, the, the structure of this uh, plasma channel onto, into a vSIM function. And conveniently, this function can just be called in a, in a single call in the position generator. So in this case, it's, it's just a snippet of one of our pre-files. Um, so basically, we have this function, this interpolation function for plasma shape in three dimensions. And you can even include something like um, a function which sets it to zero if it's out of bounds of its actually interpolation range. So this was quite convenient and uh, something um, we, we could do due to uh, vSIM's great modularity and uh, the user func function interface. Um, but maybe just a tiny bit of physics. Why is it so important to get the shape of this plasma correctly into the simulations? Well, because it turns out um, during the experiment that the shape and particularly the width of this plasma channel is actually very um, substantial for the strength of the plasma wake field. So just to give a quick overview, um, here you can see something like a nice ordinary blowout. Um, and if this plasma channel now becomes narrower and narrower and basically the boundaries of this blowout touch the boundaries of the plasma channel, then electrons are expelled ex uh, beyond the ion channel. And this results in an elongation of your wake field. And if you reduce the channel even further, um, the wake field uh, diminishes significantly until it breaks down in the end. So this quite a sensitive effect on the plasma channel size is um, one of the reasons why we really had to dig into detail um, how this interacted in our experiment. And just to give you an idea here, um, you see here this line going along this plasma channel profile and you see accordingly how uh, the wake field, uh, the accelerating field actually changes and you see this elongation features once uh, you go into a narrower bit and then it contracts a bit more um, and ultimately it gets weaker and weaker. And this is of course a problem for your entire accelerator um, because as you can see here, basically the phases um, shift uh, depending on your particle position. And which basically means that your accelerated particles always feel a constant phase shift. Um, and this actually results in only a few acceleration phases which are actually experimentally accessible. And uh, to, to actually um, evaluate this, we track this through the entire simulation, which is uh, almost a meter long. And as it turns out, once we did that, we could really track the energy evolution of all these possible ejection and accelerating phases. And this, in the end, turned out to fit very well to our measured energies. So this really was um, quite an um, um, intense process to really make the um, the simulations as close to the experimental conditions as possible. Um, but in the end, it revealed basically the underlying process of um, our achieved energies. And of course, such an approach of really putting a complete experiment into a simulation enables you to identify all these critical boundaries. And these are all lessons learned, um, as we heard already, um, which also go into the development of new ex experiments, particularly uh, follow-up experiments, to this at uh, FASI 2. But um, how about if we don't just look at past experiments and try to understand the detailed processes better, but also um, how can simulations help us designing and developing really new experiments? Um, and for that, typically, you would start from existing experimental capabilities um, and likewise identify crucial parameter ranges 
and try to expand the conceptual design and overcome such issues before you actually start the experiment. Um, and simulations there can basically mimic your experiment before you actually built it and feedback to how you would like to change the design to, um, to resolve particularly sensitive parameter scalings um, to uh, have an idea how to refine your experimental components. And this is really meant to be a loop, not just before, but also during and after your experimental work. And one of the examples I, I quickly want to explain um, is what we, how we use VSIM um, in our hybrid plasma wakefield accelerator collaboration um, with our many great partners. And which is basically uh, the idea of using these laser wake field accelerators to drive uh, beam driven wake field accelerators. And this is just a short recap of what you already heard. Basically, what I want to remind you is that the main difference between using a laser field or an electron beam field as a driver for a plasma wake field accelerator is really the, um, the field strength involved, which can be three orders, easily three orders of magnitude higher when you use lasers as a driver, um, which also affects your ionization rates, right? So if you use electron beams, it's much more favorable for, for uh, selective ionization and therefore controlled injection mechanisms. Now, the funny thing is um, that these sort of LWFAs actually can excel really in delivering compact and high current electron beams. And this is particularly what is required to drive a PWFA. And this, is, this becomes interesting once you realize that there are hundreds of high power laser systems which could produce something like this but also very few PWFA facilities. So um, by, if you want to exploit um, the several advantages that uh, beam-driven plasma wakefield accelerators give you in terms of reproducible and controllable electron beams, and you have a great driver here, basically you just need to combine the two um, to get a new hybrid wakefield accelerator. And this is basically the idea behind it. So what we propose is a novel and even further miniaturized uh, accelerator platform based only on plasma accelerators, where we use such a laser-driven plasma wake field accelerator to, to generate high current electron beams, which in turn drive a second wake field accelerator, now driven by this exact electron beam, where you now can think about um, controlled injection experiments here. Um, and particularly interesting is because this is all based on one uh, initial laser. This also offers you to have precise and intrinsic synchronization if, for example, you would like to use a plasma photocathode for injection. And the general idea is that, that this really is a really compact laser based platform, um, which in the end delivers high brightness electron beam. And you see that, that this is basically a scale of three millimeters. So your entire accelerator, even with these two stages, is on a centimeter scale. Um, and this is something we want to realize. So what VSIM enables us to do is uh, do precise injection studies of several various injection schemes you could realize now here in this sort of LWFA beam driven PWFA. Um, and just a few technical examples of how you could do this in VSIM. Uh, for example, you could, uh, besides plasma photocathode injection, you could think about also of generating hydrodynamic shocks. And this is something where you also need a quite a, a, a distinct plasma shape and you need to implement this into VSIM. But this is a, a shape which is not complicated enough that you couldn't do it with built-in features. Um, like here, I just posted a sample snippet um, of one of our pre-files where we basically use um, ST functions, which are multiplied and each one is a cosine flat top. And this is a really um, convenient uh, capability that VSIM allows you to, to just plug in numbers and get your shape right. Another one is the plasma torch injection that Paul already mentioned, where we typically use um, another, um, uh, another implementation method and really define custom functions because we call them then um, over the pre-file over and over on several occasions and you can just really use these functions and change the parameters and so on, which is um, really convenient. So, but the entire idea of doing this is to have already at the very beginning of your design process, something like a close feedback loop between your experimental team, your experimental design, and also the construction requirements of your experiment. So what we really want to do is have um, having um, a simulation framework for these kind of hybrid accelerators 
which is efficient, flexible, and easy to use. And this is basically what we came up with. And here's just a, a tiny overview of uh, some of the tricks we actually exploit, which are provided by uh, the Reason framework. Um, all is meant to tweak performance, accuracy, and also provide easy to analyze data structures. So again, we use um, things like beam initialization, we use uh, dispersion control, absorbing boundaries. Um, for performance, we tend to use neutral fluid ionization, fluids for uh, or ionization species instead of sampling everything with macroparticles, which for ionization is perfectly fine. Um, we can separate the individual fields and particle contributions uh, to get a better idea of what are the individual contributions. We also use um, a custom domain composition, decomposition to improve the performance on high computing clusters, high performance computing clusters. Um, and this is also um, to, to a great amount automatized. Um, and the entire idea is that basically you have a few top level variables which can switch on and off individual experimental components to see their individual contributions. But also the entire structure of the simulation framework is defined by only a very few actual physics parameters um, from, from your experiment. So basically what you could do, you could um, really just um, implement this in a VSIM composer like fashion and uh, provide this also to experimentalists um, which are sitting in the control room during their shifts and need to have quick answers to um, an effect they have just seen. And just a, one other example, because I personally like it very much, is um, that we also uh, implement some sort of customizable dump rate. So you can extract more data points during in injection, because this is where you usually want to look at in detail. And this can be easily done. Um, it's just one, a few lines of code, um, something which I particularly find nice. Um, so it's basically almost my last slide. <laughs> what I'm going to show here is just one of these um, simulations. Um, basically, you have an electron beam, you drive your plasma wake, um, and here you see this feature of a reduced increased dump rate during the injection. Now, basically, the dump rate will speed up, and you see, yeah, you do, you're producing something. This is by no means optimized, but this is directly coming from the simulation framework, and you can identify different contributions to the electron beam and this massive dark current here. So you can use this really to optimize your experimental uh, parameters while you're building your experiment. And you, you put the same knobs into your pre-files as you would also tune it during the experiment. So you can really have a direct feedback between simulations and experiment. And this sort of interconnected um, loop between experiment and simulations is what we're trying to do in this hybrid collaboration. And with that, that's actually everything I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's great, Thomas. Thanks very much. And uh, I know we are running late and I have no one to blame but me because you all started with a backlog, but well done. So I, I just have this summary slide. So we basically started to uh, really rely on um, on PIC codes, first starting with UPIC and Warpool, now VSIM. Uh, 10 years ago, yeah, and we uh, produced quite some highlights, I think, and of course advanced our uh, capabilities uh, in with regard to simulation. So this is just to say that um, many of these findings really triggered a new thrust in the community um, and um, uh, across various uh, areas, uh, injection, uh, acceleration, plasma-based metrology, and this all comes now together in this uh, sort of uh, culminating roadmap. We have still stuff to do, but uh, it's, it's just been a beautiful experience in particular, because if, if things get also then experimentally uh, confirmed. Um, so uh, yeah, this, this is basically my, my summary. Um, VSIM really enables us to push to develop new ideas, to push them into experiments, to guide them, to analyze experiments, and then move on uh, towards the next step. And so far, that's, I think, quite remarkable. All these uh, uh, ideas which we've developed uh, and simulated in VSIM uh, in a proper way um, behaved as in the simulation in the, the experiment. And that's, of course, uh, an acid test for, for such a combination of simulation and, um, uh, and experiments.